I'm traveling this weekend, so our show features a talk given in 2011 by Hans Hermann Hoppe here at the Mises Institute on the subject of praxeology, or the science of human action. Now, it's a term and a topic that can be intimidating to some people. And at 52 minutes, Hoppe's talk is quite a bit longer than our usual weekend show, but it's very important, I would say vitally important, to understand why praxeology is the proper economic methodology. And I'm sure you'll enjoy and benefit from Hoppe's razor sharp discussion. So stay tuned for a great talk by Hans Hermann Hoppe on praxeology. The question that I want to address is, what is the status of economic propositions. Is economics some axiomatic deductive science or is it what is nowadays called an empirical science? Or to formulate it somewhat differently, economic propositions uh, logically derived from some firmly established starting point and hence provided that no flaw occurs in the course of logical deductions, statements that are absolutely true, or as Mises said, apodictically true, or are economic propositions hypothetical statements that require some sort of empirical testing. And I want to show that contrary to widespread beliefs, these types of methodological questions are of utmost importance and have fundamental implications depending on what the answer to this riddle is. If we look at the present situation, then we can say that all economists, except those who belong to the Austrian school, believe that Economics is an empirical science in the same sense as physics and chemistry is an empirical science. Now, this does not mean uh, that all economists actually practice what they preach. In fact, we can say that the better economists among the mainstream economists are people who don't really practice what they preach. That is, they frequently act as if economic propositions are not testable propositions, but when you ask them, are they hypothetical pr uh, propositions that need to, be test need to be tested, then they say, yes, of course, they need to be tested. Now, the Austrians, while they are complete outsiders nowadays, were not outsiders some 50, 60, 70 years ago. Actually, the view that uh, the Austrians hold that economics is more of more akin to logic or mathematics in the sense that their propositions do not require to be tested, this view represented until maybe about the 1950s or so, uh, the mainstream position. Until the 1950s, the most famous book dealing with the methodology of economics was a book by Lionel Robbins, The Nature and Significance of Economic Science. You can get that here in the bookstore, a very good book. Uh, and Lionel Robbins uh, had been heavily influenced by Ludwig von Mises. He frequently went to Vienna, and if you look in his book, Ludwig von Mises is more frequently cited in this Nature and Significance of Economic Science book than anybody, uh, than anybody else. And this view that economics is more like logic was also the position held by many famous 19th century economists such as Jean-Baptiste Say, and Nassau Sr., John Cairns, and so forth. The adoption of the new view held nowadays by almost everyone except for the Austrians, that economics is an empirical science that 
formulates hypotheses that require continuous testing. This view was adopted mainly because of the influence of modern positivism. And modern positivism is the modern air of the empiricism, in particular, as espoused by David, by David Hume. The most influential group of people promoting the positivist view, the empiricist view, is the so-called Vienna School, or more precisely, the so-called Schlickkreis. There existed in Vienna at the time various groups of intellectuals. There existed Mises Kreis, for instance, where he assembled his students, and there existed also a Schlick Kreis, where the logical positivists came together. Ludwig von Mises' brother, Richard von Mises, a famous mathematician, was also a leading member of this Schlick Kreis. Because of that, the two brothers had a somewhat complicated, not always friendly relationship. If I give you some famous names of logical positivists, many of them are nowadays forgotten, but uh, once upon a time they were very influential. Moritz Schlick, Rudolf Carnap, Hans Reichenbach, Gustav Hempel, Otto Neurath, and also Karl Popper, who did not refer to himself as a logic positivist. He used a different term, he called himself a critical rationalist, but that was some sort of a misnomer very much like liberals nowadays in the United States are about the opposite of liberals were in the old days and still are considered to be in Europe. So he was not really a rationalist, but he was a logical positivist too. He just adopted a different type of name. This school was not very influential in Europe at the time, but became influential in the United States because most of them happened to be Jewish and emigrated to, to the United States and acquired quite prestigious positions at some leading universities in, in the United States. Now, I want to give to you their basic views and use Karl Popper as the main representative of this group. So his view and by implication, the view of most of these people is the following. There exist two types of scientific propositions. The first one we call empirical propositions. Empirical propositions say something about the real world. And empirical propositions must be either verifiable, that is, we must be able to find out that they are true, or they must be falsifiable, that is a particular Popperian view, falsifiable by experience. We must be able, by referring to experience, whether they are false or what makes them false. Statements that are not falsifiable are not scientific statements. Nothing can be known about reality with certainty. Everything that we know about reality is hypothetical, must be testable. And on the other hand, we have uh, statements that are called analytical statements. And analytical statements are statements that are true by definition, such as bachelor means unmarried men. They do not say anything about reality, they just say something about how we use certain words, how words are defined. And their view was that logic and mathematics, for instance, are analytical statements. They do not say anything about real things, they just say something about how we use certain symbols. Nothing about reality at all. That is a very unusual view. Most people before thought that logic and mathematics does have something to do with reality. And of course, as I mentioned also last night, normative propositions about what is good and what is bad are not cognitive propositions at all. They are just expressions of emotions. More particularly, 
they saw that the task of science is to give explanations, and explanations have the same structure as predictions. They are always of the kind, if A, then B. If then statements are, so to speak, the characteristic of science, and these if then statements need to be testable statements, they must in principle be falsifiable by experience. These if then statements are statements that have universal terms, that is, if A, A refers to all sorts of things that fall under the category of A. Then B, B is also a term that refers to all things that fall into the class of B objects. Now, if we find that a hypothesis is confirmed, that is, our hypothesis if A, then B, if we observe an A and a B indeed follows, then we would say the statement is confirmed. But a confirmation of a hypothesis is not a verification. That is, we do not know that the statement is really true because the hypothesis refers, of course, to an infinite number of examples. All that a confirmation does is, so far the hypothesis has not been falsified. So far we can accept it but we do not know whether it is true. It might be that in the future we find instances where A was the case, but B did not follow. And on the other hand, if we observe A and B does not follow, then we would say the hypothesis has been falsified. But a falsification also does not mean that A and B are not related at all. All it means is they are not related as the initial hypothesis stated. That is, it might well be that A is the cause of B, except we might have to control some other variables as well. So if C and D are also fulfilled, then we can observe that A is indeed the cause of B. So a falsification does not mean A and B have nothing to do with each other. The hypothesis just has to be rephrased. We can always find excuses, so to speak, why A was in particular cases not followed by B. And the view of the positivist was then about the progress of science is we formulate hypothesis, then we try to falsify them, and if we falsify them, then we reformulate the hypothesis, formulate a new hypothesis, and thereby we gradually approach the truth and scientific progress results. They also had a specific view on definitions. According to them, there existed two types of definitions. Either ostensive definitions, that is, by pointing to something, this is green, or this is a tree. Or they were stipulative definitions, that is, such and such is defined as such and such. Bachelor is defined as unmarried men. Those are the two types of definitions that they allowed. Now, before I come to a refutation of this empiricist, logical, positivist research program, so to speak, I want to make you aware of the relativistic implications that this research program involves. To make you aware of this is not the same as refuting it, but it might be good to make you somewhat skeptical about it. And I want to show you what the relativistic implications are. The first one is obvious, that is simply we can say nothing about what is right and what is wrong. Ethical statements are not scientific statements at all, according to their view. But there are more important relativistic implications as well. The implication of these empiricist views is that we, in the social sciences in particular, have to engage in some sort of 
piecemeal social engineering in order to find out what is right and what is wrong. That is, they imply that we just act as if we were social engineers. Now, to make this clear, what I have in mind with this, um, I want to give you first a number of examples where we would clearly say these are hypothetical statements. Consider these hypotheses, and I agree that these are hypotheses. Children prefer McDonald's over Burger King. Worldwide beef consumption to pork consumption is two to one. Uh, Germans prefer Spain over Greece as vacation destinations. Longer education leads to higher wage rates. Consumer spending before Christmas is higher than after Christmas. Catholics vote predominantly democratic parties. Japanese save a quarter of their disposable income. Germans drink more beer than Frenchmen. U.S. produces more computers than other countries. Most inhabitants in the United States are white and of European descent. Now, if you hear these statements, you'll realize that um, we can, in each case, also just formulate the opposite. We could say, for instance, that children prefer Burger King over McDonald's, or worldwide beef consumption to pork consumption is one to two, or longer education leads to lower wage rates. Consumer spending before Christmas is lower than after Christmas. If we would negate these statements, we are obviously not saying nonsense. Which one of these, the original one or the negation of the original one, is right and which one is wrong, we can only find out by making observations, looking at data, and then we find out it is true that children prefer McDonald's over Burger King, or it is not true that children prefer uh, McDonald's over Burger King. These are clearly hypotheses, and what we must do is we must collect data, so to speak, to determine is this right or is that right. Now consider, however, some economic propositions. Consider this, for instance. Human action is an actor's purposeful pursuit of valued ends with scarce means. Or, no one can purposefully not act. Or, every action is aimed at an improvement over what otherwise would have occurred. Or, a larger quantity of a good is preferred over a smaller quantity. Or, what is consumed now cannot be consumed again later. Or if the price is lowered, either the same quantity or more is bought. Or prices fixed below market clearing prices lead to shortages. Or without private property in production factors, there can be no prices. And without prices, cost accounting is impossible, or interpersonal conflict is possible only if things are scarce, or no thing or part of a thing can be owned exclusively by more than one person at a time, or property and property titles are distinct entities, and an increase of property titles without a corresponding increase in real property does not raise social wealth, but leads to a redistribution of existing wealth. Or if the minimum wage is increased, let's say, to $1,000 per hour, then massive unemployment will result. Or every voluntary exchange benefits both exchange partners, otherwise it would not occur. Or Every coercive exchange involves a loser and a winner, one who gains in utility and another one who loses in utility. Or 
if we increase the amount of money without increasing the quantity of non-money goods, social wealth will not be higher, but only prices will rise. Now ask yourself, are these second set of examples that I gave the same type of statements as the first set of examples that I gave? That is, would we accept the position these latter examples that I gave are also hypothetical? That is, that we have to go out and test them to find out whether they are true or false in the same way as we would have to go out and test whether people indeed prefer McDonald's over Burger King or the other way around. Now, the astonishing thing is that the logical positivist claim that there is essentially no difference between the first set of examples that I gave and the second set of examples that I gave. That is, the second set of examples, such as minimum wages of $1,000 an hour causes unemployment, is also a hypothesis. That is, if it is a hypothesis, then we would be able to negate these sentences, and they might also be true. We do not know. So, if I say, for instance, a minimum wage of $1,000 per hour, if enforced to the hilt, might increase employment. A coercive exchange benefits both exchange partners. A voluntary exchange benefits one at the expense of another. Increasing the amount of money without increasing the quantity of real goods increases the general standard of living. Now, I trust that you immediately recognize that there is something fundamentally wrong to think that these statements might be true. That is, that it might be true that a coercive exchange benefits both exchange partners, that a voluntary exchange might just benefit one at the expense of harming someone else. I trust that you realize that the negation of the second set of examples that I gave strikes you as absurd. How can we possibly test a statement like this? But according to the positivists, they are hypotheses. They must be tested. If they are not hypotheses, then, according to them, these statements do not say anything about anything real at all. So now back to what I said, what are the relativistic implications of this? So if we say these are hypotheses, then in order to find out whether a minimum wage of $1,000 per hour increases employment or decreases employment, what is the only way that we can find out which one is true? We would have to try it out first because we don't know the answer a priori. We do not know in advance what the answer will be. Socialism. Mises' argument, you will hear more about that in the course of this week, I'm sure, is Economic calculation under socialism is impossible because if there is no private property in factors of production, then there exist no prices for factors of production. If there exist no prices of factors of production, then we cannot compare the input prices and the output prices and cannot determine whether we produce efficiently or inefficiently, whether we make profits or losses. If this is a hypothesis, then what do we need to do in order to find out whether this is true or not is we have to introduce socialism first. And then we find out whether it is true or not. And if we find out that it is not true, that standards of living, let's say, go down, then we have, remember, falsification does not mean that we have proved that there is no connection between the variables that we try to associate with each other. It only means the hypothesis is not quite right the way we have currently formulated. We can just say, oh, that might be different if we also control the weather. Or if Stalin puts on a hat, which he did not put on the year before, 
or if we murder a few more Ukrainians, then it might work out perfectly all right. <laughs> so there is an endless way of finding excuses whenever things do not turn out the way that we initially predicted based on our processes what would come true. An example currently of importance, doing monetary easing, printing ever more money in order to allegedly create ever more wealth in society. Obviously, all economists except the Austrians are of this opinion that you, if you print additional pieces of paper, uh, social wealth will somehow increase. Now, what if it doesn't increase? Then you might just say, oh, the quantity of money that we have added to the existing quantity of money was not increased drastically enough. But if you increase it even more drastically, then, of course, you will see that the result will come out, will come out right. You have an endless line of excuses whenever things do not go the way that you want them to go. Now I want to come to a more rigorous refutation of this claim of the positivist. I'm almost convinced that you realize by now that there is something fishy about this this whole idea. Now, Mises proceeded in the following way. He just said, look, if this distinction that the positivists make about uh, there are either empirical statements that must be testable or there are an analytical statements that do not say anything about reality, what is the status of this distinction between uh, empirical statements and analytical statements. Obviously, if we apply the argument to itself, then this distinction between there are only empirical statements and there are analytical statements must be either an empirical statement, that is, it is empiric is a hypothesis, there are empirical statements and the analytical statements and nothing else, uh, but if it is a hypothesis, it might be just wrong. So why should we accept this distinction if it's just uh, the hypothesis itself, or, and that's the second alternative is, or it is an analytical statement. And if it is an analytical statement, then we know it doesn't say anything about reality at all. So again, why should I then accept this type of proposition? Either it's a hypothesis, and I can just formulate the opposite, or it is an analytical statement and says nothing at all. Or, and that is of course the third alternative, but the alternative that the positivists cannot admit, that this distinction between there are only analytical statements and there are empirical statements is itself a statement that is non-hypothetically true. But that is something that they do not admit as possible. The same we can apply to their view that all of science consists of explanations and explanations have the same structure as predictions. That is, they consist of if-then statements. Now, what is the status of this explanation of an explanation? Is this explanation of what explanations are an empirical statement? It's a hypothesis. And then again, we could say, so what? We can just formulate the opposite just as well. Or it is an analytical statement, then we have no reason to believe it. That is simply a verbal convention that we made. We could just as well make some other conventions. The same also applies to definitions. Definitions are either stipulative definitions, one word is defined by another, or they are ostensive definitions where I point to something. But what is the status of the definition of definitions? Is it again just a hypothesis about what definitions are? Or is it simply a verbal convention that we accept that we define definition in this way? Or is it something else? And again, Austrians will say, yeah, there is something else. That is what we call real definitions. Definitions that accord to the nature of things. Now I want to proceed further and show that Whatever we might think about this research program, it certainly can't apply to human actions. Let me explain again how 
according to positivist, the process of science works. So we begin with a hypothesis and we test the hypothesis and we can either falsify the hypothesis or we can confirm the hypothesis. Recall, confirmation does not mean it's true. It means just so far it has not been shown to be false. So we have to continuously retry a new test. Again, that can, test can falsify or it can confirm. If it falsifies, we revise the hypothesis and then the revised hypothesis is again tested and it can be either falsified or it can be confirmed and so forth and so forth. Now ask yourself this. When we have a hypothesis and the hypothesis is tested and we said it is confirmed, uh, we must make an assumption. And the assumption is, why don't we, for instance, just say, first I found this result and then I tested it and I found the same result again. Just a repetition. Why would we say this confirms it? Or I have a hypothesis, then I falsify it. Why can we say that it is falsified? Why can't we just say, first I found out this, and the next time I found out something else? Now, the assumption that we must make in order to say the second observation, second set of observation is a confirmation, or the second set of observation is a falsification of what we had observed before, the assumption that we must make is that the nature of things did not change. That is, that the nature of things is constant. Otherwise, if things sometimes work out this way and sometimes things work out that way, we would not say this is a confirmation. This confirms what I thought before. Otherwise, it would be just a repetition. And if we think that things are work out sometimes this way and sometimes that way, we would not say it is a falsification. We would just say, okay, first we observe that, and then we observe that. But that doesn't mean that any consequences follow from that. That any consequences follow from it. That is that we say, this confirms, this makes us believe the same thing will happen again in the future, or this falsifies, this makes us believe that the next time we have to revise our hypothesis requires that we assume the nature of things did not change. Nature of things is constant. Now the question is, can we make this constancy assumption when it comes to human action? And the answer is no. The hypothesis now refers to some hypothesis about human actions, not the hypothesis about whatever the behavior of material objects. But a hypothesis refers to people did such and such or do such and such if these and these conditions exist before. Now, but can we make this constancy assumption when the hypothesis refers to human action? The answer is, as I said, is no for the following reason. Now, obviously, the person that engages in this research process uh, is part of the realm of, of uh, the objects about which the hypothesis has been made. But what, what happens to scientists or the person who does regression analysis in order to test certain hypotheses, what happens to the person depending on the outcome of his tests? Obviously, if we falsify our hypothesis, the person knows something that he did not know before. He is, in a way, a different person than he was before. He did not know the outcome of the test before he actually conducted the test. The same is true if the hypothesis is confirmed. After all, that is the purpose of the entire enterprise. We learn something that we did not know before. So the process of engaging in this scientific endeavor is precisely a process that leads to a result 
of the kind that I'm different now after the test than I was before the test. The purpose of the test was precisely to inform us about something that we did not know before. So what we realize here is that it is impossible to predict, so to speak, what the outcome of the research process will be. That's why we engage in research. So people are different after each test. After each test, they know something that they did not know before. And since all of our knowledge influences how we act, what we do, we reach the conclusion that it is impossible to predict our own future states of knowledge until we actually have it. And since we cannot predict our own future states of knowledge and our states of knowledge influence how we act, we also cannot predict in any scientific way how we will act in the future in various circumstances. So predicting human action is not a science. Predicting human action is what entrepreneurs do. This is an art, but nothing for which we can formulate, so to speak, formulas that allow us to make correct predictions, formulas that other people could apply in the same way as we, as we, applied, uh, we applied them. But there is also an implicit admission of something else. So while it is impossible to predict human actions in the same way as we predict whatever the behavior of material bodies, because we learn after all, and the learn our learning influences how we will act in the future, and we cannot predict what our future states of knowledge are until we actually have them, we have also gained an insight that is true about every one of our actions, about all human actions, namely that there are no constants, no empirical constants, allowing us to predict what we will do in the future. So we also have what we can say is a priori knowledge about action, namely that this type of prediction that most mainstream economists think they are doing and they should do, that this thing is not possible. So we have also a priori knowledge of action. It might not be telling us a lot of things, but it does tell us something of utmost importance applying to each and every one of our actions and to each and every actor. Now let me explain this by using one example. Let's take the law of marginal utility. That is, in a way, the most important of all economic laws. The law states that if the supply of a homogeneous good increases, by a unit, then the marginal utility decreases. Or if the supply of a homogeneous good decreases, if we have less of a good, the marginal utility increases. Now, how do we come up with this law? What we realize is the first unit of a good will always be employed in order to satisfy the most highly ranking of all desires that can be satisfied with this good. That is a logically true statement. The first unit of any good by any actor, by every actor, will be used in order to satisfy what this person considers to be the most important use that can be made of this good. If I have a second unit of the same good, then, again, by definition, the second unit will be used in order to satisfy the second most highly ranking goal that can be satisfied 
with the help of this particular good. If I have three units, then the third unit will be used in order to satisfy the third most highly ranking goal. If one unit is taken away from our supply, it doesn't matter which unit is taken away because they are homogeneous. We regard each good as equally serviceable as every other. But we have to do without one satisfaction less. Which satisfaction will we give up? And the answer is, of course, we will give up the least important of the previously satisfied satisfactions in giving up one unit. Now, you realize that this statement is an a priori statement. There is no way that we can ever think of how could this statement possibly be falsified. On the other hand, what it does not do, it does not tell us, of course, anything about what is my most highly ranking desire. So, again, use an example. So I have an orange. I can apodictically say the first unit of the first orange will be used in order to satisfy my most highly ranking desire of all desires that can be satisfied with an orange. But I cannot predict what that desire will be. Will it be eating the orange, squeezing the orange, using the orange as a baseball, throwing the orange away, giving it to somebody as a present? None of that we can predict. That depends on knowledge that we have, on changing ideas that we might have about what can be done about an orange. Let's say I find out that oranges are, are no good for anything, then I might throw it away. The next day I find out oranges are really good because they have lots of vitamin C, then I might ingest them. Or I find out that oranges can be used for this purpose as well. They can be squeezed. I didn't know that they could be squeezed before. And now I think my most important use of an orange is to squeeze them. None of that I know. The second unit will be used in order to satisfy my second most highly ranking desire that can be satisfied by means of an orange. But I do not know which my second one will be or what your second most important use of an orange will be. It might also be that that changes. Today you thought the first most important use of an orange is to do such and such with the orange. And tomorrow you might think that it is far more important to use the first orange for an entirely different purpose. None of those things, all the things that can be influenced by changing knowledge, by changing values, all those things cannot be predicted in a scientific way. I'm not saying that they cannot be predicted in a non-scientific way, in an entrepreneurial way. Yes, of course, entrepreneurs make constant predictions in terms of people will use this for such and such, people will use it for such and such, people will value this more than they value this and so forth. But this is not, nothing scientific, because if it would be scientific, it could be just imitated. Everyone would be just equally good as an entrepreneur, and we all know that that is obviously not the case. But what we do know is that whatever our various uses, our various rankings of goals are, the first unit will always be employed in order to satisfy the most highly ranking desire. The second one will be used to satisfy the second most highly ranking desire. And the third one will be used in order to satisfy the third most highly ranking desire. It isn't the same as what I indicated last night. Logic does not tell us much about reality. But what it does tell us about reality is of utmost fundamental importance. Economics might not tell us much about what humans will do here and there in, in this situation, in that situation. But what economics tells us is of utmost importance. So if we want to compare the Austrians to mainstream economists, we can say, the Austrians are in some ways more dogmatic. Let's say 
certain things we know apodictically. It cannot be different than this way. And we do not need to test this at all. And to test it is a sign of intellectual confusion. It is as if somebody thinks that he has to test the law of Pythagoras, let's say, by measuring triangles. And then if he finds out such and such results I have gained in the United States, that he has to travel to Australia and to find out whether the same laws of Pythagoras hold in Australia as well. You would just say, that is absolutely stupid. Why do you do something like this? On the other hand, we are far more humble than the mainstream economists. Because mainstream economists think they can predict what my most highly ranking goal of using an orange will be and what my second most highly ranking goal of using an orange will be. There the Austrians would say, no, that's, that sort of enterprise is a silly enterprise. This is something that entrepreneurs have to do. And if you are so smart, you economists, why aren't you as rich as the entrepreneurs are? So Austrians are dogmatic in a small area. And they are very humble in most other areas. And mainstream economists are all around confused. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>